This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. Every company does, or at least they should be, looking to the future. They should be looking for the latest, newest product that they can innovate, that they can develop, and then sell to consumers. If they don't, well, quite simply, they're going to be going the way of the dodo. And after all, the world has changed considerably in the past decade or so. It's now much more globalised, and companies are much more efficient with much more dominant technology. Patrick Medley is a managing partner of global consumer products at IBM Business Services. He's been here at the Australian School of Business to speak to AGSM MBA students. So Patrick, how do you innovate those new products that consumers are going to be buying in a few years' time? Well, it's, uh, it's very different from how it used to be. I mean, quite frankly, Many years ago, most of the consumer products companies, the pharmaceutical companies, had huge organizations that basically did R&D. And so through that, we had the R&D business, and they would basically do all of their development internally. What we're seeing now is actually it all opening up. So for instance, Procter & Gamble now does 60% of its innovation using external sources. Uh, they've got an alliance with the University of Cincinnati. They're based in Cincinnati. So they're accessing all sorts of different ways to try and find new ideas. So it's not just you know, the internal organization. It's now trying to find out who else can help us. One of the interesting things that companies are doing is actually reaching out to alumni, as an example, people who used to work for the company. Uh, p and is, again, a classic example of that. Uh, going out to the alumni and saying, hey, ideas. What else can we be doing? And out of left field, the other thing that organizations are now starting to do is to listen to things like social media. So people chatting on the net, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a grapefruit flavored Coke? And I'm just using a completely <laughs> hypothetical example here. But people chatting away on those sort of things and Coca-Cola is listening and saying, hey, that's a good idea. Why don't we try that out? So, you know, the source of innovation has really exploded, I think, um, over the last literally 10 years. Rather than it just being a sort of an internal thing, it really has gone out into seeking ideas from wherever they can come from. But isn't that very dangerous for the bottom line? Because you're going to spend a lot of money chasing after these ideas for people who don't work for the company. They don't know the culture or the backstory. And so you might end up just going down all these dead ends before finally you find something that would even work, let alone sell it to the customers. Well, a, a number of comments on that. Number one is the fact that something like only one out of 10 new product introductions actually succeed. So in terms of the investment that has to go on in not just developing the product, but actually putting all the marketing behind it as you launch it, as you try and get it out there into the marketplace, uh, there's a huge number of failures. And so when you start talking about the cost of doing a development, it's actually much better if you're already tuned in to what the public want as you're doing that sort of development, taking ideas from the public rather than necessarily just waiting for uh, just your own ideas and then putting them out there in the marketplace and waiting them for, for them to fail. Uh, you know, this whole idea of looking for the next blockbuster, quite frankly, for most consumer products companies is critical. And, uh, and they certainly recognize that it's probably cheaper to actually be looking at a wider range of, of sources than just trying to do it internally. Uh, and when it comes to actually getting it out into the marketplace, what's more important? Is it the retail staff physically on the ground in the store itself that's going to sell it to you, the marketing people who'll develop the theme behind you do want this latest gadget, or the techie guys who are actually going to make it work? Oh, gosh. Well, it's a combination now of, of really a large number of different players. To start off with, it's, it is about the actual product itself and does it resonate in terms of the consumer, does it, uh, does it actually fill a need that the consumer actually uh, is looking to fulfill? Um, you know, the retailers play a very important role in this whole process. And obviously, it does depend on the sort of innovation in terms of what we're talking about. For instance, grocery, you can't really do a new launch of a new product unless you're prepared to put in Australia it on it in the Woolworths and the Coles, etc. But at the same time, I mean, there's multiple ways of getting the message across. So I'm seeing some very innovative things happening, for instance, using things like YouTube. And uh, Old Spice, just another example of a product that, quite frankly, was a dead product for many people around the world. Um, it was something that my father used. And a very successful campaign using mainstream media as well as YouTube to get the message across very, very successfully. And just one of the little tricks that, uh, that was used in that particular case was actually getting consumers to say, hey, this is what we'd like to see in an advertisement. 
starting to that, get that sort of two-way communication going with the consumer that helps to get the, the consumer bought in. So, you know, it doesn't have to just be through retail. It's really how you use the multiplicity of ways of basically communicating what you're trying to do to the consumer. And yet you've got to have something that will appeal to the consumer Absolutely. and will actually do something where they're going, hang on, that's yeah. new. I didn't realize that, that, that you could do that. Beyond the customer's imagination of offering yeah. them something new, how do you achieve that? Well, it's, uh, let's just go back a step in terms of what the consumer is looking for, because the consumer today, quite frankly, is very different from the consumer of, say, 10 years ago. Uh, we talk about moving from the, the bell curve to the well curve. So the traditional way in which most people develop products was let's aim at the midstream and we'll get a sort of a, a product that does what it needs to do and we'll focus on everybody and we'll put an advertisement on television and bang, we'll hopefully sell it. What we're seeing is basically though that the consumer is actually turning around and saying, well, I'm moving in two directions. The first is towards value. So does this product actually fulfill a need that I need at a sensible value for me? It doesn't need to be the cheapest, but it needs to be at a reasonable price for me to turn around and say, yes, I want this. So we've got this sort of shift towards value. At the same time, though, we've also got this shift towards the high end happening. So, you know, I don't necessarily need this, but I want it. It fulfills a perceived need from my point of view. It says something about me. Uh, and, you know, we're seeing this happening outside, for instance, Westfield in, uh, in Sydney. Uh, the queues that are developing outside the Louis Vuittons, the Pradas, the Bally's, etc., uh, which is people turning around and saying, you know, I don't actually need to spend $1,000 or whatever it is on a handbag, but it says something about me that I've arrived. I could go to Kmart, get a $100 handbag. Or I can get a $1,000 handbag or whatever the price is. I don't buy handbags that regularly. <laughs> whatever the price happens to be from uh, Louis Vuitton. But, you know, people are prepared to pay that because it says something about you. So you've got this bifurcation taking place, this whole value concept. You know, I, I have to buy it as something I need for the family. Or I'm buying it because it's something that says something about me. And so we've got this bifurcation taking place. It's important as companies develop new products to understand this. Are we actually aiming for a product that's actually at this value equation that does sort of satisfy a basic need of the family? Or is this a product that is sort of aspirational? And so understanding that, I think, is a very important part of the whole innovation process. Yeah, uh, and indeed another fascinating product, a mobile phone. Just yeah. a few years ago, you'd expect to make a telephone call on it, and that would be it. And then suddenly, cameras. Who would have thought that you could put a camera yeah. into it? Beyond somebody's imagination, but suddenly so useful. Yeah. Then the rise of smartphones. That's exactly fascinating right. Fascinating to see them. But if you yeah. still want your basic vanilla phone, yeah. you can get one. You where, can. Where, where do you think we're going to go? Um, oh, look, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited by the technology here, quite frankly. I'm seeing a, a huge shift taking place in the way that people use phones. I mean, I, I had one of the very first mobile phones in Australia. And it was, um, I was running around in a, in a car, which had this huge block, basically, which was the phone, but I could actually, for the first time, take it out of the car. Huge innovation. And we're, we're only talking about the mid-80s, not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Today, the way in which people are using the phone, it's a communicator, it's an info, it you know, gives you the information. As you say, it's much more than just being a camera. In fact, when I present in India, I uh, sometimes turn to the audience and say, you know, I, in the very near future, as you develop the smartphone for India, I can see that as I'm presenting to you, you're not going to be listening to me anymore. You're going to be watching the cricket on your smartphone. Frankly, it is going to be the technology that basically connects you to everything. And as we see uh, the whole web moving towards the cloud, it'll be the connector into so many different sorts of applications and mechanisms that allow you to do everything that you want to do in your everyday work. You know, I, th I think it's just so exciting, some of the developments that's taking place around the mobile phone, that uh, in the long run, you have to challenge uh, the logic of having a computer if you can actually do everything on the phone. But we'll wait and see when, when that uh, actually happens. Well, well, in fact, picking up on something you said there, the development of the cloud 18 months or so ago, then, well, if you wanted to carry data around, it would be on a USB stick. Before that, you'd be carrying around a floppy disk. Yep. Now, suddenly, it, it's all in the virtual world. It is. A fascinating development there. But yep. Is that really safe? Can people really trust it? Well, I think it's getting, I mean, you always have to challenge safe, safety and security in these uh, sort of circumstances. But frankly, the companies that are doing everything on the cloud are putting a lot of effort into making sure that it is secure, it is safe from the hackers, that the data that they actually have there is, is as safe as it possibly can be. And quite frankly, it's just as safe there as it is on your own computer, which can also be accessed, as you know, from all the various programs you have to load on your computer to stop people accessing it in the first place. So, you know, to some extent from a security point of view, I think it's just as safe, if not safer. 
I think the great thing about the cloud, I mean, I've seen the same explosion as you have, you know, the whole thing is just, just exploding around us in terms of the discussion, the debate, all those sort of things that are going on around it. Um, I think it's great. I think the future is definitely in the cloud. Uh, the fact that we don't all individually need to be buying this and that and the other in terms of the, the various um, applications that we've got that we can just access them on the cloud. I mean, my email's now on the cloud through Gmail. I can access it anywhere I want on any device that I want. So I'm not tied to a single computer in terms of, uh, of, of my email. So, you know, that's the, that's the future, I think, in terms of the cloud. And interestingly, I mean, I think when you start thinking about the cloud on one hand, and the way in which we're moving in terms of smartphones on the other, um, it does challenge perhaps the way in which computing might be going in the future. Well, in fact, does this mean that we're then going to see the end of the desktop PC and we'll end up with very small but smart devices that we could say plug into a screen if we need them to, and those people who are running clouds will go back to the idea of these huge, great big mainframe computers that store all our data for us, and we just carry around a little box in our pocket, that means we can access it. Well, ironically, uh, Thomas Watson, who was the founder of IBM 100 years ago, predicted that the world only needed three computers. And everybody laughed. Maybe he was right. Be interesting to see how that develops. The fact is that if you actually do have everything on the cloud, all can be on some big computers around the world, challenges the future in terms of what we might be doing with computing. Now, I'm not going to say we're going to get there tomorrow. I think we've got a long way to go. But I still think it's interesting how this might have actually come full circle. But we will wait and see. But all this technology is as nothing if you can't actually use it. I know IBM in the 90s poured in loads of cash into what at the time was called human factors, basically developing all these different interfaces, finding out how people actually use computers, and partly because of that we now have some of the interfaces that we have nowadays. But still I'm seeing some appalling interfaces coming out on smartphones, computers. Have we still got a long way to go to understand how we as a person can directly interact with the yeah, technology? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that's another fascinating space. And, uh, you know, we've all been there with our bumbling thumbs trying to get these tiny little keys to, to work and all the rest of it. You know, I do see some changes taking place in, in that particular space. And, you know, I've already started, for instance, playing on an iPad with, uh, with just, just using, you know, doodling along on it. And, uh, and the technology is certainly improving in that particular space very rapidly indeed. So the handwriting recognition. I think the way in which uh, speech recognition you know, so we don't need to, to be writing anything anymore. The, the, the ability to take the, the spoken word and just translate that into documents or whatever it happens to be. I think those are the sort of technologies that, that will actually um, accelerate over the next few years. And again, I, you know, I think we're in for some exciting times as, as these things start to, to get launched. Yeah, and particularly as companies compete with one another. Absolutely. Now, if you've got this great product, if, say, you're the first person where you've got the interface so you can talk to your computer and do everything you want to just by communicating with it, scrap the math. How do you actually set yourself up? How can you compete so that you will then become the dominant market leader? Well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question when we start talking about dominant market leader because you know, I have this little theory that as you get a dominant market leader, so you actually cause fragmentation at the other end. So very similar, for instance, in brewing, where we've got all the big brewers and then you've got the, the emergence of all these craft brewers and you know, the guy who's got a, a cask out the back of the pub. Um, you know, I think when I look at, uh, at the way in which some of these developments are likely to happen, I think it's going to be that combination of the big company, the big investments taking place, but it's also that individual guy writing the app, does something new, tries something different, gets it out there, people like it, and so we move forward. You know, don't forget how Facebook started. You know, one or two guys and we will, won't go into the, the legalities of how many guys it was, but you know, a certain number of people uh, sitting there at, uh, at university saying, wouldn't it be great if we could communicate in a different way? And now look at Facebook, the most popular um, uh, internet site in the world. And, uh, and in a very short space of time, you know, if we'd looked 10 years ago at what was the most popular website, it certainly wasn't Facebook. So, you know, to me, that's the great thing in this particular space. It's not about necessarily big companies and small people. It's how everybody works together and small people becoming big companies, uh, you know, moving on, evolving, all of that happening in a far more rapid time frame than we've ever seen before. OK, then. So finally, if I'm asking you about time frames, next 10 or 20 years, the top three innovations, technologies that we're going to see coming to the marketplace? Oh, I think number one, as we've been discussing, is, is the smartphone, OK? And the smartphone is going to go global. So whereas, for instance, India, China today is still very much the mobile, you know, I think we'll see the very rapid involvement of that into the smartphone. And that will, quite frankly, I mean, I see the smartphone as changing dynamics 
uh, in markets, for instance, like, uh, like India and China. I think that's a very, very exciting possibility. And then as I look from a you know, more modern world, if I can call it that, um, point of view, I mean, I think we'll just see it doing more and more. You know, you walk into the supermarket, welcome, Patrick. Um, notice you haven't bought any of these recently. Would you like to try them out two for one? You know, this direct communication, if I can call it that, the conversations that will be happening between the corporate world and the individual. Traditionally, the corporate world has basically told the individual, this is a good thing to buy, the classic advertisement. You know, there's no communication in that advertisement. You're basically being told that this is it. You know, I challenge companies today, and I turn around to them and say, what do you know about me, Patrick Medley? You know, you should be able to jump onto your databases and say, hey, Patrick likes this product, doesn't like that product. I'm going to have a conversation with Patrick about these particular products. So I think this whole thing about how we're going to move from this transaction basis to, to being far more relationships, conversations, making, uh, making choices about who I have those conversations with, I think that's going to be very interesting. I think the third, um, quite frankly, and again, we've been discussing it, is, is the way in which we see the cloud evolving. I, I seriously would suggest that by the time we're sitting here in 20 years' time, uh, there will be so much out there on the cloud that, uh, that we'll be able to access, whether it's spreadsheets, whether it's email, whether it's the latest information on this, that, the other. You know, one of the biggest challenges that organizations face in the future is basically data. And today we're talking about companies basically you know, having petaflops of data that they have to manage today. And um, the future is basically going to be around zetaflops or whatever the next you know, big flop is going to be. And I'd certainly challenge most organizations to start working through uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years that huge volume of data that you're going to manage and how you're actually going to manage it securely, safely, hopefully on the cloud, accessible on a smartphone. Going to be interesting. Certainly seeing how far we've come over the past 20 years, it's going to be a fascinating time. Patrick Medley, thank you very much. My pleasure. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.